Greetings and hello out there, my excellent students. Brian Doak coming at you here from my office on the campus of George Fox University. Um, today we're going to be talking about theodicy, particularly in the books of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and with a, with a glance at one particular psalm, Psalm 73. Um, these books are rich in, in, in implication for our study of Christianity and the problem of evil. There's no way we can mine the depths of what each of these books has to offer. Rather, we can take a glance at some of the, the glaring features, at least, remark on a verse or two here or there, and in particular, look at, look at the various theodicy strategies that we see, if we can even identify a strategy um, in any of the books, and look at the ways that they seem maybe similar to or different from each other. Now, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the book of Job, which we'll examine in some separate lectures, are sometimes grouped together. Um, in the Old Testament as the so-called wisdom books, wisdom books, books that are meant to impart wisdom. What do these books have in common that makes them wisdom books? Scholars debate about that genre title, and in the end, maybe it's a very imprecise, um, imprecise label. Aren't all the books of the Bible prophetic and Torah and others trying to impart wisdom in some way? Yeah, maybe. The wisdom books, uh, particularly Proverbs, use the word wisdom, though, chokmah, very explicitly. And in fact, all three of these books together um, use a phrase that's really common um, to these wisdom materials, namely the phrase, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a driving concept in the wisdom books. Indeed, Proverbs chapter 1 begins um, famously um, in the first few verses, culminating in verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Job is full of this phrase, and so is Ecclesiastes. Um, it's not clear that all three of these books, though, have the exact same meaning of the fear of the Lord. Um, it, you might read Ecclesiastes and get the sense that the fear of the Lord means something like truly a terror of a God that is barely known, of a God that cannot be known, of a God in whose presence you better shut your mouth, as the author of Ecclesiastes famously says. God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be you. Don't pour out your heart to God with all of your problems, okay? In Proverbs, um, on the other hand, the fear of the Lord seems something maybe more like what a lot of readers of the Bible would hope it would mean or expect it to mean, something more like a sort of respect due to an authority figure. And certainly it means that in Ecclesiastes as well. And Job, although Job as well, um, certainly comes with a, with a dose of, of, of all kinds of fear, terror and horror at the kind of, of tragedy and death that could overtake you at any moment, um, and, and, and maybe quite literal fear, trembling fear at the presence of a God who's just above and beyond it all. So as you read through these books, you can, you can think for yourself about what, what this phrase, the fear of the Lord, um, truly means. Let's begin with Proverbs in, in examining some of the theodicy and suffering, uh, Im implications about theodicy and suffering, and the problem of evil that we've been um, exploring throughout the course so far, um, Proverbs chapter 1 sets a tone for the book. I read that verse, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Um, but there's a kind of opening poem, which is the address that you get in these first really nine chapters or so. The address of a father to a son or a king to a son. Traditionally here the author, um, Solomon. In fact, uh, Proverbs 1.1, 1, 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David. So you have a father-son relationship there kind of set up and you have... Um, this idea of a, you know, a, par a parental figure speaking to a child. Verse 8, hear my child your father's instruction and do not reject your mother's teaching. So actually you have a father and mother in parallel there. So very gendered images in Proverbs, but it's really a, uh, you know, a, a mother or father parental figure. Notice some of the imagery here used in Proverbs chapter 1, though, to talk about wisdom. Um, he, verse 8, chapter 1, Hear, my child, your father's instruction, and do not reject your mother's teaching, for they are a fair garland for your head and pendants for your neck. Very visual images, right? And I think those very visual images are, very, are, are, are really appropriate for what, what you see in the book of Proverbs, namely the idea that wisdom is something you can see. You can see the results um, of wisdom and of, and of the teachings in your life. So it's definitely the case for the author of Proverbs that if you're living a right life, we should be able to see that in the world, physically. The garland uh, on your head and the pendants around your neck, okay? This idea of 
wisdom and righteousness being something you can see in someone's life and in behavior has implications for a theodicy and for suffering, right? It has implications for what we've been calling repeatedly the act consequence nexus, the 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 connection driven home in so by so many biblical authors that you will get what you have earned in life. Um, the author of Proverbs one goes on and, and has this poem talking about you know saying, "My child, if sinners entice you, do not consent." If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us wantonly ambush the innocent. I mean, who says that, right? Who gets you who, who gets you in a room and says, hey, let's go find some innocent people and kill them. I mean, I know that there are serial killers in the world and psychopaths and things like this. But I mean, are the, are the moral choices we, we make really that obvious? Maybe they should be, the author of Proverbs thinks. Or maybe if you stop to think about it, they are. But I mean, you know, we can think about this in the complexity and texture of our own lives. Rarely does life seem to present something so blunt, you know. And yet, the author has this kind of scene. Verse 17, For in vain is the net baited while the bird is looking on, yet they lie in wait to kill themselves and set an ambush for their own lives. And there you see the classic theodicy of the book of Proverbs on full display. If you set about scheming to kill another person, guess who you're actually going to kill? Only your own self. You can lie in ambush, but whose life are you going to take? Your own, right? There's a very strong connection in Proverbs between the things that you do and the things that you get. Um, put famously in Proverbs in one of the sayings, the one who digs a pit will fall into the pit. Okay. Um, this, and this particular theodicy approach, I think chapters 10 and 11 are really good chapters to read um, if you want to if you want to really get into this kind of morality, this it's almost like a kind of moral math. R diligence and sobriety and good works equals success and wealth and health, right? Bad behavior and disobedience and foolishness is going to equal poverty and loss and death, okay? And that very strict math is pounded home over and over again. Let me just read a smattering of verses from from Proverbs chapters, uh, well, really just, we could just take from Proverbs chapter 10 that I think really drive this home. Verse three, I mean, here it is. The Lord does not let the righteous go hungry, but he thwarts the craving of the wicked. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever follows perverse ways will be found out. Um, Verse 15, the wealth of the rich is their fortress, the poverty of the poor is their ruin. The wage of the righteous, righteous leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. Uh, verse 22, the blessing of the Lord makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Verse 26, like vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so are the lazy to their employers. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be cut short. Um, and, and from chapter 11, just a couple as well, verse 6. The righteous of the upright saves them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their schemes. Verse 8 of chapter 11. The righteous are delivered from trouble, but the wicked get into it instead. Okay. What are you hearing? What do you see when you read these passages? I mean, what's the implication if you die young? Quite simply, that you have sinned. For the text says... The years of the wicked will be short, but the fear of the Lord prolongs life. If my life wasn't prolonged, I guess I didn't fear the Lord. Can the author really mean this, though? Is the challenge here spiritually and in terms of one's maturity in life not to read something like this and to think, okay, I need to think really hard about when to apply a verse like this. Say, say from a Christian reading, say you're reading this and you're like, I want to know when to apply this to my life. Maybe I just wouldn't apply it at every moment. Maybe if uh, a you know a child gets into a car, you know there's a, a child is is hit by a car and dies. God forbid. Maybe you don't go to the funeral and say, well, I guess their life was cut short for wickedness. You know, you wouldn't maybe find a, a, a starving person, you know, and 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 go up to them, find a homeless person, and say, oh, a slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. I guess you've you not been diligent. Your slack hand has caused poverty. I mean, if you, you know, 
if you want to go try that out on people, why don't you try that out? Try that out in life. See how well that works to kind of do that. See if that passes Josiah Royce, the American philosopher Josiah Royce's funeral test. Can you, can, do you think that would console mourners at a funeral? The fear of the Lord prolongs life, you know. So you can see what the challenge is here, right? I mean, how, whatever your conclusion is here, whether, you know, hopefully this puts you in kind of like a sudden, uh, a sudden kind of grip of the book of Proverbs. Can, you know, can you read this and really believe this? Does the author really mean this straightforwardly? If you say, well, the author doesn't mean it, there's got to be nuance here, you have to think about when to say it and when not to, the problem you run into with the book of Proverbs itself is that the author never adds any nuance to it, just keeps saying this kind of thing over and over and over again. You can read the whole book. I'm not denying that you can, I'm not denying that you can't find a verse here or there which might complicate the situation even slightly. For example, um, Proverbs chapter 29, I think, has a kind of, uh, or I'm sorry, chapter 30. Um has a kind of an odd poem that seems not totally of the tone of the rest of the book, which could sound very much like Ecclesiastes, a book we'll look at in a minute here, which is very different. True. I'm not denying you could find a verse here and there, but this this um, act consequence thing perhaps nowhere finds its strongest expression, maybe outside of the book of Deuteronomy, than in the book of Proverbs. It's really strong. So this is the pinnacle of this way of thinking in the book of Proverbs. It's very straightforward. Maybe we can detect something, though, a little off about this. I mean, why does the author need to insist on this so hard so many times, over and over and over and over again? Is it perhaps in the face of doubt or some other kind of experience or perceived doubt or experience on the part of the reader, of the audience? Namely, that I live my life thinking all of my good deeds, all my good work, it's all for nothing. And maybe I could get away with some wickedness. Oh, I didn't get struck by a lightning bolt right away. I did some shoplifting. You know, I did some this, I did some that. I had an affair. I did whatever, right? And I didn't get struck by a lightning bolt immediately. So maybe I just got away with it. Maybe the author here is trying to assert something by faith in the face of experience. Um, the author doesn't go and state what that experience is. Presumably something very different from what actually from the kind of simplistic schemes that the, that the text would seem to provide. So maybe this is kind of like a kind of a faith protest against a world in which it seems as though um, the righteous are being punished and the guilty are being rewarded or something like that. So maybe that's a way kind of out of the iron moral math here, that this is a kind of a statement of hope in the face of something else. The author doesn't quite say that though. I'm just, I'm sort of like, you know, going a deep level of interpretation here, a second level, trying to think about like, how can the author keep saying this over and over again? Is this really life experience? If anything, in our time, in our era, maybe we would say that this author seems to be speaking out of a place of enormous privilege where you can assume that like, if you just work hard, you'll be able to, you know, get a great job and get a house when we know that many people, especially, you know, probably in all eras and times, but I mean, there's a lot of talk, at least now in our economy, that this is just isn't the reality for a lot of people. You graduate from college, you do all the right things, and then boom, there's nothing waiting for you. I mean, what the heck? Maybe in the face of that experience, the author of Proverbs or the speaking voice throughout these chapters would want to say, ah, just wait for it. You will be rewarded. It takes time. God will reward that kind of diligence. Well, you can read these chapters and think about it. What about the book of Ecclesiastes? Now, this is a very different book. It's hard to read Proverbs and Ecclesiastes back to back and not think that there's some kind of competing vision going on here about this question of theodicy and suffering. Whereas Proverbs said that, in fact, um, there's a pretty quick, there's a, there's a strict reward for the righteous and a punishment, punishment for the guilty. The author of Ecclesiastes has some really different things to say. Um, let me just skip to one of the, one of the money ball passages here. Um, in chapter, um, in, uh, where am I looking? Chapter 7. The author's get, getting into some Proverbs-like statements. A good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death than the day of birth. Better to die than to be alive, says the author of, of, uh, of Ecclesiastes. Ver, verse 3 of chapter 7. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of countenance the heart is made glad. Be sad to be happy. Wait a minute. Is the author here saying that suffering is actually good? Suffering is good for us. Maybe you get, you know, some, one of these viewpoints, like many that we've seen throughout the course, that somehow suffering or, or, or difficulty is actually good. It, like, helps us. What about verse, verses um, um, 11, 12, 13 and following? 
Wisdom is as good as an inheritance, an advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money. And the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom gives life to the one who possesses it. The protection of money. That's a fascinating phrase, right? Consider the work of God, verse 13. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? Wait a minute. What has God made crooked? God has made things crooked? Verse 15. This is fascinating. Uh, no, I want to read 14 as well. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. If things are going well, be happy. And in the day of adversity, consider, God has made the one as well as the other, so that mortals may not find out anything that will come after them. I mean, the author is striking a really consistent note here. God has made things crooked, and God has made a day of prosperity for joy, but also a day of adversity. God has made both, the author says. Verse 15, in my vain life, I have seen everything. There are righteous people who perish in their righteousness. Uh-oh. And there are wicked people who prolong their life in their evil doing. I mean, this is like the exact opposite message from the book of Proverbs. Verse 16, do not be too righteous and do not act too wise. Why should you destroy yourself? Do not be too wicked and do not be a fool. Why should you die before your time? It's good that you should take hold of the one without letting go of the other. For the one who fears God shall succeed with both. Succeed with both? You mean, okay. I mean, these are some tough verses, right? I mean, granted, I've gone straight to a very meaty passage here. And you have to read the whole book of Ecclesiastes and see, see if this reading here and this interpretation seems fair. But I think that you will see it's fair. That the author is engaging in statements like this constantly. Righteous people who perish in their righteousness. Wicked people who prolong their life in their evil doing. Do you think the author of Proverbs could have uttered those statements? I mean, traditionally, Solomon is the author of Proverbs, or at least a lot of the book, and then uh, Solomon would be the traditional author of Ecclesiastes. We could have a long scholarly debate and go far afield talking about whether Solomon is actually the author of Ecclesiastes. I don't think that he is. Most scholars don't think that Solomon is the author of Ecclesiastes, but cast that aside. Let's just say Solomon is the kind of speaking voice, the speaking persona in both books. How could a person experience that the righteous always get their righteous due and so do the wicked, but then also the righteous sometimes um, perish in their righteousness, but also the wicked succeed in their evil doing? One traditional way of making sense of this is to see Proverbs as the view of, of King Solomon during the, you know, kind of like the prime of his life. He's like, the, you know, a stable king. And in the world working as it should work, the book of Proverbs is the ruling morality. You kind of get what you pay for. But as Solomon gets older, so this legendary way of thinking about the authorship and the mood goes, um, as Solomon gets older, he's kind of bitter. He's a decrepit old man. He's just angry about life, right? And so he writes Ecclesiastes as kind of like, you know, anticipating death. And in the face of death, we see that things don't always work out the way that, you know, we think we have a lot of optimism, maybe when we're young or when we're kind of in our, you know, approaching middle age, we're very powerful. We have our job. We're kind of as attractive as we're ever going to be. Things seem very rosy, but toward the end of life, Ecclesiastes is a meditation on death. Still, though, the question remains, right? And could ask us, especially those of us who are people of faith, Christians, who see the Bible as God's word. How is it that we hold these two views in tension with each other? Do we just kind of say when things go wrong? Yep, Ecclesiastes, this is the way it is. But when things go well, do we just say, yep, book of Proverbs, it was right all along. I mean, uh, is that how you know when to apply them? When things just happen the way, I mean, you get stuck here, right? If, if, if Proverbs, if the iron morality of Proverbs is correct, there should actually be no exceptions. Exceptions actually invalidate the scheme, the act consequence scheme, right? If you throw, if you throw a wrench into those gears, the whole system breaks, Ecclesiastes is about the breakdown, but in Proverbs, it's fully up and working. So what the heck is going on? I mean, the book of Ecclesiastes begins with a fascinating poem and a statement really encapsulated just in verse two. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. That word vanity in, in Hebrew um, really means something like smoke or vapor, something that just flits away. Um, vanity, absurdity, nothingness, meaninglessness even. If life is meaningless, why should we try to give it meaning by applying an act-consequence scheme, right? 
granted, Ecclesiastes is quite a ringer in the canon and the collection of books in the Bible. It's not, it's not your typical book, as I think you can see. But now we see our first big bombshell to the act consequence scheme. The book of Ecclesiastes seems to be a blatant and repeated and very bitter refutation of the act consequence scheme. Okay? Life is unhappiness. Life is suffering. It's not even good or bad. It's just like the way God has ordained it. In the end of the book, you could get some maybe some traction which gets you, gets you back into the act consequence scheme. Just like in the heavy act consequence books, we also found places where maybe there were things like forgiveness or redemptive suffering or other things that cut against that grain. I mean, the end of the book, the author says, fear God and keep his commandments. That's the whole duty of everyone. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Okay, so at least there's a judgment coming here. You kind of just do what you do. But the question becomes, what kind of God is it here that's doing the judging? A God who has made some things crooked, apparently. And the author uh, tells us, don't be too righteous. Can you imagine the author of Proverbs telling you, don't be too righteous? So we see here, I think, two very different visions of suffering. It's meaning, it's causes, and, and, and thriving. It's meaning and it's causes as well. Before ending here, I just want to turn to Psalm 73. I feel like we haven't treated the Psalms enough in these discussions. The Psalms are rich with theodicy and suffering language, often bitter cries of lament. I mean, this is one reaction to suffering that the book of Psalms teaches us. We lament, we cry out to God and say, how Long is this going to last, God? There are some psalms, though, like Psalm 73, for example, which seem to deal very explicitly with theodicy um, in a way. Psalm 73 begins, Truly God is good to the upright, to those who are pure in heart. Sounds very act consequency, right? But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant. I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Uh-oh, we see a world here which is upside down according to the proverbial standard, right? I saw the prosperity of the wicked. There should be no prosperity of the wicked. The wicked do not prosper. That's the whole point of, you know, the Lord rewards the righteous and punishes the guilt, you know, the wicked. But the author here is already starting the poem by saying, I know God's good to the upright, and yet I'm looking at some things where the wicked are prospering. And he goes on and on saying, oh, the wicked, they have no pain. Their bodies are perfect. Everything's great. How is this possible? The author cries out in verse 13, All in vain I have kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I have been plagued and am punished every morning. The situation of innocent suffering. So the speaker here, whether the speaker's really innocent or not, okay, is making a claim to innocence. I've been innocent and I'm suffering and they're winning and this whole thing is screwed up. This whole thing sucks. The author says, I, you know, I talked on and on like this. However, I thought this was true until, verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I perceived their end. Truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. On awaking, you despise their phantoms. Such fascinating language, right? I wonder if in the world of the poem, the imagery, the, you know, the author goes into the sanctuary, into the temple. The author goes to church, you might say, and has a kind of different vision of the world. Have things actually changed in the physical reality of the world? I don't know. I wonder if what the author is saying here is when I, when I go into the sacred place with God, I see in fact that this wickedness that seems to be succeeding is like a phantom. It's like a ghost. It's like God, it's like a nightmare, a dream when one awakens, like a phantom. It's not real reality, even if it appears to be reality. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was stupid and ignorant. I was like a brute beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel, and afterward you receive me with honor. Whom have I in heaven but you, and there is nothing on earth that I desire other than you? And the poem ends, Indeed, those who are far from you will perish. You put an end to those who are false to you. But for me, it's good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge to tell of all your works. So the author ends here kind of on a note of, of faith. It's just good to be near God. It's good to be in the temple. It's good to be in the sacred space where the outside world is relativized for what it is, a phantom, a dream, a nightmare even, something which is going to change and we'll see it later. 
So we see a kind of theodicy here of a certain kind of deferral, of a certain kind of reorienting. I need to reorient my world first to see it as something different from what it appears to be, the wicked succeeding and the righteous being punished. And I can do so by going into God's presence. And there's a certain kind of hope then that the psalm expresses, that maybe even somehow hope against hope after death, that you'll receive me with, with honor. Whom have I but you, uh, the author says. It's almost as though the author has to throw himself or herself, however you imagine the speaking voice, just back on God time and time again as a theodicy solution. All right, that's it for this one. See you later.